Is this some sort of rule or something that when you retire, you sit around and watch the Western Channel? I, my father-in-law does that. I mean, he, he's got like a great lazy chair, and he sits around and watches Westerns all the time. I mean, you've seen one. You've seen them all, right? Oh. Uh, one of my favorite movies, of course, is Tombstone, so I'm not throwing any rocks. That's, I've, I've seen it so many times, I've got it memorized. I love the 1800s, though. I love the Old West. I like watching movies about the Old West and the 1800s and the good guys and the bad guys, the Lone Ranger and the Silver Bullet and all that. There's a trope that exists within the whole Western genre, and you're familiar with it. I know you are. You know, when they have those western boom towns that just kind of spring up out of nowhere, maybe somebody found gold or silver, but then this city just kind of appears, a little town, and there's something that happens in that town that creates a lot of excitement when the traveling medicine man comes to town. You know what I'm talking about. It, you've probably seen this picture, something like this. You know, the guy that's got the little wagon, and it's, you know, old medicine show. What, what would happen? This, it's not really a, an invention of Hollywood. This really happened. These traveling medicine men, they would, they would send out some of their helpers to the city next on down the road, and they would plaster posters and billboards and banners and all kinds of things, generating a lot of excitement about this guy that's coming, and it was... For the most part, it was entertainment. They'd have the muscle man. He'd come in and do great acts of strength. Or they'd have the bearded woman. I'm not going to point any fingers. They'd have the bearded woman there. Or they'd have the dog in the pony show. But that was all there to create a lot of excitement, get a big crowd to watch the things happen. That would happen right there on the street. In between acts, the medicine man, he would begin his sales pitch for something that he possessed that was a miracle cure. A lot of, and he would have a whole list of things that these cures or elixirs would take care of. And, and he, he was very clever. He would take people that, he'd hire people and plant them out in the crowd. And so whenever he'd say something like, you know, if you've got explosive diarrhea, this will cure it. Somebody in the crowd would say, I had explosive diarrhea yesterday and it cured it. You know, and everybody's like, I want some. That's how he'd do that. That's how they'd sell that. The tonics, the elixirs, the, the potions, they only mask the pain. Uh, most of those things contain large amounts of alcohol or morphine. And that's what they would do. I mean, it was just, so if you had this ailment, it would just kind of mask the pain and you would think that you were cured. Some of the most exotic elixirs that were sold, would, would, they, they would market it that it would contain this thing called snake oil. You've heard of that, right? A snake oil salesman? That's, that's where that comes from. They would, they would say, you need to buy this. It will cure this explosive diarrhea because it's got snake oil. And people would give away their hard-earned money. One of the more popular elixirs that existed actually contained cocaine. <laughs> it's still on sale today. Coca-Cola. That's where Coca-Cola come from, was from these guys. It, contained, it don't contain co cocaine anymore, of course, but, well, maybe new Coke. But, but those things, I mean, that, that was the dynamic in the late 1800s. By the 1900s, these shows began to disappear because people caught on that these so-called miracle remedies didn't actually work. But that doesn't stop people from looking for that miracle cure. It's that same dynamic still exists today. We're going to be in John chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 5. What we're going to read here is the ultimate physician that heals. This is Jesus here in John chapter 5. He is, began His public ministry there in Galilee. 
And he's done all kinds of teachings, healings, and miracles. So the first year of his, of, of his time with his disciples, it was a year of obscurity. He wasn't well known. In fact, you remember the story of turning the wine or the water to wine in Cana. He wanted every, it's not his time, but now it is. And so he's growing in popularity. His name's getting out. And as he grows in popularity, so too does the opposition. Religious leaders can't stand him. Of course, he calls into question everything they teach and, and their way of life. However, here in the beginning of John chapter 5, it's time for the Jews to celebrate what they call a feast. Now, it, John here, whenever we read this, he doesn't name the feast. We don't know what it is. We know that it's a Jewish holiday, Jewish celebration. It could be the Passover. It's not important. John only says this to give us context for the reason that Jesus is actually in Jerusalem. Most of Jesus' ministry has been spent up around the Sea of Galilee. So he gives us this background that it's the time of this Jewish celebration, this feast, to cue us in the reason why Jesus is in Jerusalem. Because, this is something you need to know, Jesus was God's sinless Son. He followed the law to the letter. And the law required that Jewish males had to go to Jerusalem whenever a Jewish celebration or feast took place. And so that's what Jesus would do. He was a good Jew, and so he follows the law. Now, I'm not talking about man's law. He's talking about God's law. In fact, Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 5, I think I've got it on the screen, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill and so if you're a Jewish man and you were required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate this particular feast, that's what Jesus did because he's a good Jew. He does what's required of him. But this visit is going to set off a conflict that will ultimately get him killed. Look at John chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool for when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. And they said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. That, the law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Have you seen The Chosen yet? Have you watched that? I recommend that to you. That's free. And it is free. You can watch The Chosen. It's, it's a, it's a mini-series, multiple season mini-series about the life of Jesus as seen through the eyes of the disciples. Fantastic. And I don't do cheesy Christian stuff. I mean, I'm, mm -mm, this is well made. But this story is done in the second season of The Chosen and done so well. It began to, you know, kick me off thinking about what this would have been like. There's three observations that I want to make before we get into the point of, of the teaching here. And the first observation I want to make is that, once again, archaeology continues to prove that the Bible is accurate. You know, people question the Bible's accuracy, whether the Bible can be trusted. And for years, for years after this was written, they... People who are skeptics would say, you see, you can't trust the Bible because there is no pool there at the Sheep Gate. Number one, the Sheep Gate doesn't exist. That's what they would say. 
then they'd say, and then there's no pool. So most scholars dismissed this story as an unhistorical literary creation. But archaeology proved them wrong. In 1888, the pool of Bethesda was discovered. You know where it was? It's weird. The crusaders had went in and built a church over the pool. And so whenever they destroyed this crusader church and began to excavate the ground underneath it, lo and behold, it was next to the sheep gate. And the sheep gate is now just called the lion's gate. That's what the, day, the term is for it today. And as they began to excavate it, they found out it does have five porches. Once again, archaeology is correct. The pool is actually located beside the Muslim quarter in today's Jerusalem. Uh, there's a church there called the Church of St. Anne. If you ever go to Jerusalem, you can go there and see this pool of Bethesda. I've got a picture of it. Here's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. Now it's kind of broken down, and, and, but you can still see that it's something. Bethesda actually means, uh, it means house of mercy. That's what the Hebrew term for it is, the house of mercy. So this invalid, this paralytic man, he had went to the house of mercy seeking mercy. That's the first thing, that I, first observation, that's free. Second observation is that as we read through this story, you, maybe you notice that there's no verse 4. Did you notice that? It goes from 3 to 5. Because the original manuscripts do not contain verse 4. And the Bible strives for accuracy. The Bible is going, if, if all else fails, the Bible is going to be accurate. And the original manuscripts do not contain verse 4. That's the reason why it's probably omitted from your Bible. Now some translations later from the original manuscripts contain this verse 4. Uh, but it was probably added by a copyist in order to give people like you and I in the future some idea of the significance of what's going on here. And here, here it is, if, you, if your Bible doesn't contain verse, the end of verse 3 and 4, here's what it says. So I'll just start with verse 3. And it says, Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. Now here's where it picks up. Waiting for certain movement of the water. For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water, and the first person to step in after the water was stirred, was healed of whatever disease he had. So in 1888, they found the Pool of Bethesda. And it, whenever it's finally excavated in 1964, what they realized, this was actually a temple dedicated to the Greek god Asclepius. Asclepius is the Greek god of healing, the god of medicine. And so apparently, the sick and the invalid would gather here and they would lay on the steps leading down into the pool and that pool was actually fed by a spring from underneath the city of Jerusalem. And every so often, it wouldn't flow all the time, but every so often that spring would flow and it would create bubbles in the pool. And there was a stupor, superstition, a stupid stition, if you will, <laughs> but there was a superstition that when it began to bubble, it was actually angels coming down to play in the water. And if you could get in there while the angels was there, you'd be healed. And that's the reason the man was there. So if you can imagine that scene, all of these blind men, all these deaf people, the people that were, were paralyzed, all lounging around the steps of the pool, watching and waiting. And, you know, if you're blind, you can't see when the pool bubbles. If you're deaf, you may not hear it. And if, you, if you're lame, you couldn't make it down in. So most people, if they were unable to make it in the pool, had an assistant that would pick them up and carry them down the pool. If you go back and watch that, that episode of The Chosen and you can see people carrying their, their friends down in the water. So that's the second observation is that four. That's the reason why chapter or verse four exists to give us a little bit more context about why people were there. There's actually a Greek temple of healing, Asclepius. The third observation that I want to make here is that uh, the man that we see here, he's desperate. In fact, he's beyond desperation. 
I mean, 38 years this man has lived with this debilitating illness. You know, that's, that's longer than the average life expectancy of most Hebrew men. I, I mean, it, the Scripture doesn't tell us what was wrong. We only know that he was basically paralyzed from the waist down. And he had been this way for 38 years. Can you imagine? Don't you think he had probably been to every physician in Jerusalem looking for a cure? Nobody has been able to cure him. You know, while, while he was there in Jerusalem trying to find some sort of cure, why not take advantage of this temple of healing, of these waters that were said to be stirred? I mean, when you get to that point of an illness, 38 years, you're going to do whatever it takes and you're, you're going to try everything. I guarantee you most of us in that state, although we would have been skeptical of the angel, most of us would have attempted it, right? Let's at least try it. 38 years this man went there or had somebody take him there. And he would lie beside that pool waiting for the waters to stir. The same thing happens in our culture today. There is a city in Portugal called Fatima. And, and they are convinced that you can, if you attend there and you watch and wait at the right time, the Virgin Mary appears and she provides miraculous healings there at Fatima, Portugal. I read a story this week about a, a man from New Orleans who, who was just dealing with all kinds of pain and illness. And he said he was cured when the Virgin cured him at Fatima, Portugal. Or, you know, a lot of people believe in being anointed by oil or holy water. I remember a, a time when we had somebody that I, I was friends with who, who had a loved one that was dying of cancer, and, and they wanted us to come and anoint them with oil. Some people seek out faith healers like Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland. You know, in, in the mid-2000s, there was a guy by the name of Peter Popoff, and, and he did an infomercial late at night, and he was sell, selling what was called Miracle Spring Water. Made a bundle off of it because people are convinced that that thing right there, if it's helped someone else, possibly it could help me. We're not immune here either. You're familiar with Eureka Springs? You know how Eureka Springs got its start? Eureka Springs, well, that I mean, it became a tourist trap because it was built on those springs there, and there was a healing superstition behind them. Dr. Alva Jackson swears, and this was in the late 1800s, but he swore up and down that the waters from one of the springs there at Eureka cured his son's eyesight. And people began to flock there to Eureka Springs, hoping that those same mineral waters would cure them too. And those things happen all over the world today. Hot Springs, Arkansas. Asylum Springs, same, same thing. And this, so this man is no different than us today. The only difference is the superstition he chose to believe in was the bubbling waters there at the Pool of Bethesda. How many, let me ask you, think of this. How many times over those 38 years do you think he failed getting in the pool? I mean, I don't know how many times a day that pool bubbled, but I guarantee you, day after day, he, you would find him in that same spot. And, and so everybody in the city would have known him. Oh, there's that guy. I mean, we, I saw a homeless person yesterday on the street down in Fayetteville, and she was there last week. I mean, I've only seen her twice, but it burned in my mind. You see that same person, same spot. But he's been there for 38 years trying to get in the water. And he's just, can you imagine, he's just so discouraged. Every time the water stirred, someone less disabled than he is beats him into the water. I mean, he has lost all hope that he would ever be whole again. And there's two truths that we see in the story here. If you've got your piece of paper, we'll fill this out. Number one, this story illustrates the grace and mercy of God. Out of all of the sick and afflicted there at the pool... Jesus zeroes in on this one guy. And they had never met, 
But Jesus somehow knows this man's situation. He knew that he had been there for a long time. It's like Jesus has some sort of supernatural knowledge, which of course he does. You see, not only is that true for that man, Jesus knows you too. He knows your longings, your desires, your sufferings, your pain. Just like he knew this man. And he walks up to the man and he asks him one question. And I love the chosen. I wish I could have showed it, but in the chosen, he, he squats down and gets eye to eye with the sick man. He just stares at him and he says, Do you want to get healed? Do you want to be well? I mean, what a strange question to ask, right? It's like, duh, I've only been here for 38 years trying to get in the water. No, I don't want to be healed. I'm just kind of hanging out. I mean, what a strange question to ask. Of course he wants to be healed or he wouldn't be here. So why does Jesus ask that question? Well, I think the truth is, but there's some people that just don't want to be healed. Some people don't want to change. They enjoy their misery. They enjoy the pity that is afforded them. You see, that somehow their identity is wrapped up in their brokenness and their, their handicap. Sometimes people just enjoy their sinful condition. They find a morbid sense of pleasure out of that sin, and they're not willing to give up their addictions. You know, they depend on their unfortunate condition for financial resources. You know, it, sometimes it's just easier than working or laboring. Sit here and put my hat out. Alms for the poor, it's easier than digging a ditch. And so maybe they've just surrendered to their plight. I mean, just kind of, it is what it is. Uh, there's no hope. I've tried everything. I just have to learn to live with it. Maybe they're kind of like the old howling dog. Have you ever heard of the old howling dog? You know, there's a guy by the name of Tim who had just moved to a new neighborhood. And his neighbor had this dog that kept howling nonstop every day. Ow! And Tim could not stand it anymore. So he just got up one morning and he walked over to his neighbor's house just to see what the problem is. When he gets to his neighbor's house, there's the dog on the porch and there's his neighbor sitting in the rocking chair right next to the dog reading the newspaper and drinking some coffee. And Tim just looks at him and says, is this your dog by any chance? It's been howling nonstop. And the old man kind of drops his paper. He says, oh, I'm sorry about the howls. I hope it's not too distracting. I hope it doesn't bother you. And Tim just looked at him and goes, but why is, why is he continue to howl? And they were said, well, he's sitting on a nail. And Tim says, sitting on a nail? Why does he just get up and move away from the nail? And the old man just kind of took a drink of his coffee, coffee and put the paper down, and he said, well, he doesn't find it painful enough yet. See, the, apparently the effort to change his circumstances was greater than the pain he was experiencing. We do that too. You know, continue to lay on the nail and howl about it rather than get up and do something about it. You see, that's the reason why Jesus asked him that question. Jesus wants, wants him to come to the end of himself. Are you ready to be healed? Are you willing to be healed? So his question is valid. Not everybody wants to change. Some people are satisfied with the status quo. Some people are unconvinced that change is even possible. They would say, I can't change. Some people just aren't willing to put out the effort. Some people aren't necessary, uh, willing to do what's necessary to change. You know what? Even if it's a matter of life or death, some people aren't willing to change. Quit smoking or you will die. Your, your lungs are caked. Well, you know, I just can't change. You know, when, when somebody asks that question, do you want to be healed? Normally, you'd expect an enthusiastic, yes. Yeah, I want to be healed. This guy he gives the answer like as a stupid question. He doesn't directly answer him. and Instead, he just gives an excuse. I ain't got anybody to put me in the water. He says he's helpless. He's a victim. 
Nobody is here to carry me in the water. But that's exactly what Jesus wanted to hear because He is admitting that He does need help and He can't do it on His own. I Notice in the story, He never asks Jesus for healing. He never pleads with Him to, to take care of His ailment. Instead, as Jesus is sitting there looking at Him and saying, do you want to be healed? He still continues in His mind to believe that that pool is, is the healing power that He needs. He doesn't realize that the healing power He needs is right in front of Him. And how true is it for us in our culture that people want to lay around and moan about their conditions when Christ is right there saying, I can take care of these problems. You know, I, I think the sick man was just looking at Jesus thinking, maybe this guy will stick around and he'll be the one to get me in the pool fastest. He'll be willing to wait it out with me. Jesus had other plans. Look at, look at verse 8. Matthew 5, 8. Jesus looks at the guy and he says, stand up. Pick up your mat and walk. And in verse 9 it says the man is healed instantly. I mean, we're talking about a healing that's instantaneous and complete. Have you ever broken arm? And, and had a cast put on your arm? And what is it, like eight weeks you've got to wear this cast or whatever, and then you take the cast off, and what's your arm look like? It's called atrophy. I blew my ACL out in college, and when I had surgery on my knee, and I was in, I was in this, like this air cast for a while. And whenever they took it off and I had to start going through rehab, my leg had shrunk in just a short period of time. I mean, we're just talking about a week or so. The trauma to my leg was so much that the muscles just contracted and it kind of went in on itself. The same thing happens if you ever break your arm. You'll take the cast off and you'll notice that your forearm is much smaller than the other one. Can you imagine then 38 years of not using your legs? I mean, they would have just looked like little bitty chicken legs. Look like you skip leg day all the time like Ben does. You see, but Jesus had miraculously healed this man who had not walked in 38 years. And He healed him not because of anything he had done. He healed him be not because of any merit the guy had. He, he healed him. I mean, there's. do you see any evidence of any conversion here? Do you see any evidence of repentance? Do you see any evidence of faith here? No. Jesus does, he, he doesn't get anything spiritual from Jesus. He doesn't respond spiritually to Jesus. But Jesus still heals him. That's what he does. He just simply heals him. You see, that's grace. That's grace. And that's the picture. That's, the, that's what we're talking about here. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's, it's the undeserved good that we receive from God. You see, grace is not bestowed upon men because of who they are or what they've done. It's not given to you because you're worthy and withheld from the other person because they're unworthy. I mean, men are always unworthy of grace. Nobody deserves grace. But God sovereignly bestows it upon us out of His goodness. And His love for us. And think about this. How many, how many sick and lame people do you think were laying around that pool? Jesus zeroed in on one. He chose one. He would have been there all day healing people if He wanted. But see, that's not the reason that He come was to walk around and healing people like a physician. It's a great illustration of how I am going to zero in on you. You're important. I'm going to make a point with you. But everybody that's laying around that pool, their natural response, their thought process is, if I can just do this one thing and get down in that pool, I can heal myself. And Jesus says, you don't have to do anything. I'm going to heal you freely. That's my alternative. I... I I'm going to give you this thing. And everybody else is saying, I'll please God by doing these things. Jesus says, no, I don't expect nothing from you. I'll give it to you freely. What an incredible act of compassion 
and mercy. But I, you need to know this. I mean, this has not escaped you, I'm sure. Jesus is smart. And, and, and so he's purposeful in everything that he does. And so he's not just healing this man just, just simply as a kind act. I mean, yes, it is a kind act, and he does want to do a kindness for him. But the miracle's not only for this man's benefit. He purposely heals this man who was a well-known invalid for 38 years because he knows it's going to draw attention, that other people are going to see it. He knows that whenever I draw attention to this, it's going to give me the opportunity to address a far greater issue. That's number two on your sheet there. The story illustrates his authority and deity. The story illustrates the authority and deity of Christ. He knows if I heal this man in front of all these people and I tell him to get up and pick up his mat, that it's going to draw attention, and that's perfectly fine with him. It's going to give him the opportunity to address the misunderstanding and misinterpretation of Scripture that the Pharisees have been spouting off for millennia. I mean, he wants the Pharisees to see their lack of submission to God and to His authority. He's bringing this thing to a head, if you will. He knows it's going to be a big deal. It's going to create conflict. And so Jesus deliberately heals this man on the Sabbath to illustrate His deity. I mean, there's, there's no better way to illustrate and show the world that you're God than to heal a man who's been crippled for 38 years. I mean, the Jewish rabbis... If you went and listened to them, they would have taught that illness is God's judgment. And so, if, if, if you are sick, God has done this to you, and you can only be healed by God. So, Jesus performs this great miracle. Who do they attribute the healing to? Of course, God. And so, no doubt, this man thinks, I'm sick, I'm I'm unable to walk because God has done this to me. So naturally, where would he have went to seek healing? I'm sure he'd been to the temple. I'm sure he had sought out the rabbis, asking them for healing. And the rabbinic literature does provide particular methods for healing. I mean, they had their own man-made remedies. They had folk remedies. They had certain foods that you could eat. Uh, they had incantations. They, they would recite certain pieces of scripture over you. I mean, if you come in with this ailment, you, we read this to you and it's supposed to heal. But none of that had worked. However, in full view of everybody watching, Jesus cures this man. He doesn't use any of those rabbinic methods. I mean, he, he has no need of them. And whenever he heals the man, it's completely and instantly and perfectly healed by his word. He simply said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. He does what only God can do, His deity. I mean, that's, that's an indisputable display of deity. But Jesus also deliberately heals this man because it's on the Sabbath. And He's illustrating that I have authority over the Sabbath. He's equating Himself with God. So just go back and read look at verse 9. Instantly, the man was healed, and he rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. And the Jewish religious leaders saw a man carrying his mat. I mean, that's work. You can't work on the Sabbath. Uh, the Ten Commandments specifically state you're, you're to observe the Sabbath. You're supposed to keep it holy. Over the years, the rabbis had taken that, which is number four on the greatest hits of Ten Commandments, keep the Sabbath holy. And so they said, well, what does that mean to keep it holy? So they come up with 39 tasks you could not do. And they still observe them today. You can't use any electricity. You can't light a fire. If, in fact, <laughs> you can go online and find recipes for Jewish food that you're sp supposed to start the day before the Sabbath. And by noon the next day, it will be finished and you, don't have to, you, you would not have cooked. You know, if, if it's hot on the Sabbath, AC needs to be turned on. You have your Gentile friend go do it, right? You keep a Gentile around just for that. You turn on the electricity. Uh, you couldn't even walk and pluck a, a piece of grass. You had a certain 
limit to how far you could walk. I mean, those are all man-made rules. But they contradict God's intent of the Sabbath, and Jesus wants to draw attention to this. The, the healed man, he doesn't want to get in trouble. He knows that, you know, he's carrying the mat. The rabbis see him. Why are you working? Uh, the man who healed me told me to do this. Well, who's that? Now the rabbis actually have two problems. Not only have they got this guy carrying the mat, but somebody actually healed on the Sabbath. How dare they? You see, Jesus' healing would have been the same as a physician's cure, if you will. Jesus goes back to the man, though. I want you to see this. He gives him a warning. And he says, let me find it. And the man didn't know, verse 13, the man didn't know for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning and, or something even worse may happen to you. I give you a free gift. And just like I healed your legs, I can heal your soul. I have authority. I'm God. I, I, I have put on display. I've proved to you, you know better than anybody my power. You know that I'm from God. And I'm telling you, I'm warning you, stop sinning. Some people will look at this and say, well, does that mean that all illnesses and is a result of sin? No, but it's possible. I mean, we see it right here. I don't think it's the case. I think it's a very minute percentage of cases of illness or a direct result of sin. But in this case, it was. Jesus is telling him, you didn't earn my healing. You weren't good enough for it. I chose you freely. I exercised my authority to heal you. Now, turn. Follow me. Pay attention to what I have to say. You know, and whenever he's finally confronted, and that's, this is a whole other sermon. We won't get into it. But Jesus also has the opportunity here to reveal that he is Lord of the Sabbath. That he has authority. And so your rules may say, don't work on the Sabbath. But Jesus says in verse 17, My Father is always working, so am I. So He's bringing attention to and He's saying, if my Father's okay to work on the Sabbath, that means I am too. Those Pharisees, that would, that would not have missed them. They knew, they knew exactly what He was saying, that He's God. Jesus is saying, I have divine authority over the Sabbath. Yeah, that question though, do you want to be healed? It gets right to the heart of the issue. So I ask you, do you hate your current situation, your current condition? Jesus is offering you the same question. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? Do you hate your current situation bad enough to accept my offer? Even if it means you have to leave all this behind. I mean, it is a pretty neat place. You know, the steps going down in the water. It's probably very beautiful. Probably have some gardens around. You know, and you've been coming here every day. You've gotten comfortable. You know everybody here. You know, it's kind of like the old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon where the sheepdog checks in and, you know, how you doing, Frank? Morning, you know. Everybody knows. Everybody checks in and out. But you've been coming here every day, laying on this mat, waiting for that water to stir. There's a better plan. There's a better offer. But in order to receive the healing that is perfect, you have to come to terms with the fact that you need it. And no matter how miserable your life is, no matter how lame your spiritual life is, no matter how long you've been limping, Jesus can change it. And I believe He heals physically. I do believe that. But that's not what I'm talking about. And I don't think that's the point that Jesus wanted to make to the crowd. He wasn't trying to illustrate that I have power over physical healing. I have power over your heart. I can heal your greatest need. You see, Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to shame us. He didn't come to punish us for our failures. Jesus came to release us. He came to rescue us. He came to renew us for the work 
that He has for us. So, as you leave here, I want you to consider that question. Do you hate your current condition enough to change? Do you want to be healed? If so, turn to Christ and do it today. Let's pray. Lord, what a great God you are. Lord, and there's so many things that you do in a conversation just by using five words. It's just the depth of that is just beyond human comprehension. And Lord, I, I know that you weren't talking about a physical healing, but I, I believe you can do that. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't pray for our brothers and sisters who are ill. But I don't think that's the reason you came. Lord, I believe that you came to change our heart, to heal our heart, to rescue us from the sin that has bound us and enslaved us. That is the healing you want to do. Lord, I pray this morning for anybody that's listening, that if they do not have a personal relationship with you, if they've never responded to the call and, and come to the point in their life where enough's enough, Lord, I pray that today would be that day. Lord, I am convinced you are powerful enough, you have the authority, and you are God, and you can heal us. We give you praise, glory, and honor for that great truth. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.